Fun is the future. Why? Because fun is the key ingredient that future generations will use to address the real-world challenges facing our civilization. And games will be at the direct center of this effort, because a game is like a factory for making fun. So this talk today is about games, and how I came to believe that, that, that games will truly help us solve the world's most difficult problems. So first, why am I qualified to talk about games? Well, I've met the Master Chief. <laughs> That's not too bad. But actually, I made a bad joke about Cortana, and it uh, didn't end up so well for me that, that day. But on a more serious note, I joined ETH Zurich in 2005 as a postdoctoral researcher, and now I'm an adjunct professor there. In 2007, I helped create a new course at ETH called the Game Programming Laboratory. And building this course was really the beginning of a journey for me, and I want to tell you today about that journey. So on the surface, the course is about creating games. Students work in small teams to build a new game from scratch during the semester. But the design behind the course has a much deeper educational mission. Pedagogical experts will tell you that experiential learning, where you're applying knowledge that you've learned to a concrete task, is a critical part of internalizing that knowledge. So with that idea in mind, we designed the course to serve as a capstone on top of the computer science bachelor's program and the master's specialization in visual computing. We published a paper about the course that kind of focuses on these educational underpinnings, which include also inquiry-based learning, team learning, goal setting, soft skills. And one core part of this effort was the feeling that we want to allow students to change roles from the game player to the game designer. And we felt that this effort was best served by actually using a popular game console as the deployment target. So we ordered a pile of Xbox 360 consoles, we installed them in the ETH computer lab, and launched the course. So in terms of the course design, we developed a structure that targets three main phases, design, development, and refinement. In the design phase, students come up with the idea and do all of the creative design and technical planning for their project. So here's a sketch of a game level created during this phase of the course, and this is a screenshot of the final game, uh, the final level in the game. Now, Students also build a physical version of their entire game out of cardboard and paper and scissors and glue, which is really a playable version of the game that allows them to rapidly test all of the gameplay rules and procedures and iterate on the design choices. So here you see one example, which is a physical prototype from a game that was a racing game on the Great Wall of China. And here's a screenshot from their final version. Now, the development phase occupies the middle half of the course, and this is where the computer science action really happens. So the students develop the software, the data structures, the algorithms, and even the art assets to transform that design, that concept, into a digital game. So these are some snapshots of a design of a nautical battle game set in ancient Greece, and this is a screenshot from the final version of their game. Now, the last portion of the course focuses on refinement, and here the students let colleagues and friends play their game in a formal playtesting session in order to understand whether what they've created actually lives up to their design intent. And in fact, we're fortunate to have the support of a professional AAA game studio called Gobo. Uh, the professionals in the studio serve as mentors to the students, throughout the course, and the photos you see here are actually a playtesting session where the professional game developers are trying the student, student games and giving feedback. The students use this feedback to refine their game in preparation for a final public presentation, which is open to everybody. And for the students, not only are they unveiling their work, 
but it's also the first time they're standing in front of a large audience, which in and of itself is a, is a learning experience. Now, it's been nearly 10 years since we started the course, and there have been a number of surprises. The first and foremost is that the quality of the student work has really exceeded our expectations. And this is not because we somehow doubted the talent of the students. It's rather just that you know, 13 weeks, the time we have in the semester, is unimaginably short to create a game from scratch. So I put together a clip of excerpts from a collection of games developed um, over the past years, and I want to play it to give you a feeling for the level of quality reached and also the breadth of topics uh, explored by the students. So, enjoy. Thank you. I thought that was an appropriate way to end the video because I think the students are also happy they survived once they finished the course. So you saw, you know, this was about making games, but what's happened has actually been much more. Because of the course, we've really been welcomed into the Swiss game development community and have been fortunate to establish partnerships uh, with different groups like the Zurich University of the Arts, the Swiss Game Developers Association, Pro Helvetia, the Swiss Arts Council, and Ludicious, the Zurich Game Festival. And in fact, starting last year, a collection of students from the Zurich University of the Arts have actually been taking the course alongside the ETH students to support a more interdisciplinary experience on all sides. A number of students have graduated the course to pursue careers in the game industry. So these are two former students hosting some young guests in their office. Um, it appears they're well aware of the fun factor in, in games. But what's, what's really most impressive to me is that we've been able to use this course as an avenue to promote computer science overall. So this photo is one of the students from the course showing his game uh, in a program that's meant to encourage young women to pursue uh, and study computer science. ETH has also sent a number of team members from the course to India as part of an international effort to promote computer science among the young people there. I spoke to the team when they came back to ask them about the trip, and what really amazed me was to learn that many of these youth, many of these young people we, they encountered, in fact had never played a game before in their life. So this was the first time they ever held a game controller in their hand. And I have to say, when I understood the deep impact that games can make, even across these cultural boundaries, I really realized there's something bigger here. So let's go back to the beginning. We started with ETH and the mission 
to improve the computer science program. Now, ETH's mission actually covers three different pillars, education, research, and outreach. We had education in mind when we created it, but in fact, what I realized is that the core concepts we've been teaching, the DNA of a game, the ingredients that make a game fun, can be applied to a wide spectrum of tasks. We can use this to advance ETH's core research mission, which is to use technology to really solve the world's most difficult problems. And that's the mission I'm trying to drive forward. Now likewise, in, oops, in terms of outreach, games provide a community with cooperation and teamwork at the very center. So outreach is one of the most natural things in this context. So with these ideas in mind, um, last spring we launched the ETH Game Technology Center, where we're using game technology to advance the, the mission in education, research, and outreach. So this is a beginning of a new chapter in this journey. And I want to show you three things that we've just started um, in this new beginning. So the first is a project called HeapCraft, where we're developing tools to improve collaboration in a game called Minecraft. Minecraft is a popular online multiplayer game that brings young people together to build beautiful structures and virtual worlds. But what's really interesting about this game is that these young individuals don't just play in these worlds, they actually run them as the server administrators where the games are hosted. And by studying the governance choices these young individuals are making to keep their game communities healthy and prevent vandalism and other destructive activities, we can gain a deeper understanding of the societal choices adults can make to form more healthy real-world communities. So this is a video based on 14 days of uh, worth of data, collective gameplay data from Minecraft, where we're visualizing how players explore a new world. So the regions become darker the more time players spend there. But we can also examine an individual's activity in the virtual world to automatically classify player behavior. So here, we're distinguishing in real time between building, mining, fighting, and exploring. And together, we can use this information to form an understanding of collaboration. So these visualizations represent collaborative connections between individual players performing different activities, where each colored arc represents a particular relationship between two players. Understanding these rich interactions in the virtual world is a first step toward better understanding our real world relationships. The second project I want to uh, show you, we fondly call Gnome Trader. So this is a multiplayer, location-based, mobile, augmented reality game. So what does that mean? Well, players visit newspaper boxes throughout Switzerland. And our app uses the mobile device's camera to overlay a virtual door on top of the video stream, live, as you uh, use the camera. When you tap, you can open this door and you see a little gnome living inside. The core gameplay then is trading. So here we can purchase nuts from the gnome. And if we visit another box in a different location, we can sell them with the goal of making a profit. So on the surface, we have a trading game with cute gnomes. But under the hood, there's actually a sophisticated economic simulation running that adjusts prices dynamically based on supply and demand. And by comparing different equations that govern this virtual economy and understanding how economic differences influence player behavior, we can gain valuable insight about our real world economy and better prepare ourselves to deal with real economic issues facing the world. The last project I want to show focuses on community. So, you know, games are a cultural phenomenon that have touched so many of us. For me, uh, I grew up with the Nintendo Entertainment System. 
which had a huge collective impact on an entire generation of players. But despite this collective impact, the experience of playing was pretty much an individual one. So it was always one or two people sitting in front of this little screen playing a game. So with this last, pro with this last project, we tried to turn this idea upside down and transform the original Nintendo console into a collaborative group activity where the game actually surrounds a large party. This is a concept drawing of our idea where the Nintendo is in the very center of this large event space and the game unfolds around the entire room. We develop custom software that captures the Nintendo video live and stitches it together into a single large panoramic image which is delivered to a 360 degree projection system for display. We also built a hardware board to time multiplex controller input so that eight people can play the game together with eight different controllers and the active game control is passed automatically from one player to the next every 10 seconds so that you have to be ready to go when it's your time to play. This video shows our system in action at a large social event for the Eurographics conference last summer. Um, we also deployed it um, not too long ago at the Ludicious Game Festival in Zurich last January. And it was really special to be part of this community experience where the whole party, in a way, was brought inside of the world of the game. The community engagement was really tangible. It was even a few times during the night you could hear this collective cheer break out when the group playing beats a difficult level. So, what I've shown today is the journey that I'm on. And I want to take this moment to invite all of you to join me. Especially to the young people in the audience, consider studying computer science and help me with this effort to explore how game technology can help solve the world's most difficult problems. Thanks very much for your attention.